Good afternoon, everybody from Toronto. Sorry about the little bit of delay there. I was just trying to check something on the technical side here. Greetings from hmm, Midtown Toronto, once again. I think I saw some of you uh, last week during the uh, event we hosted on the Balkan journey, which took us on a 25 year journey uh, through Bosnia. And uh, this week in the series we're running, and it is indeed a series because what we're trying to do here at Saris with my friend and colleague, Joseph Hawker, is to bring in some things that uh, lend themselves to Zoom, uh, let's say more Zoom friendly, which means we're emphasizing a little bit more on the visual or the multimedia aspect. And uh, this presentation is all that. So before I, I, I hand over to our guest, uh, Dr. Susie uh, harris Brands, I wanna say a few words about her, but I also wanna say a few words about how this all came about. Let me just say this, I think back in November, I attended a seminar at Carleton hosted by a friend and colleague, Jeff Sahadeo, uh, who runs the Counterpart Institute to us at Carleton European and Russian Studies uh, at Carleton University. And just a little plug for Carleton, and this is also for, uh, uh, for Susie too, I'm a graduate of Carleton. I did my undergraduate degree there in the 80s when Soviet studies was in vogue. And the institute then was called the Institute for Soviet and East European Studies, uh, which of course morphed into European and Russian studies. But I saw Susie's presentation about this architecture, this architectural transformation in Tbilisi. And I thought, wow, that's something we really need to have in Toronto. Because you know, on the one hand, it's a fascinating journey. On the other hand, I'm a big fan of Tbilisi. I go to Tbilisi almost every year. This is the first year I haven't gone in a number of years, obviously, for reasons uh, that all of you are aware of. So the journey Susie's going to take us on is something I find absolutely fascinating. And she's going to take us through that. She's going to have a talk that's going to last about 40 minutes. And then we're going to have a Q&A. And then I'll come back at the end, everybody, and say a few words about uh, what's up. Because we're going to have Susie back to talk about uh, Skopje in, uh, of course, the capital of North Macedonia. And uh, that's another city where I've spent a lot of time. So Susie's work is really uh, close to mine. And as I said, it, it, it's part of what we're trying to do here at Saras at the Monk School of Global Affairs and, and Public Policy, which is to bring you events that have a really decidedly visual aspect. So it's not just us talking over Zoom or academics reading papers. It's something that's super engaging. Now to our guest today, just a few words, Dr. Suzanne harris Brand is an assistant professor at the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism and a faculty associate with the Institute of European, Russian, Eurasian Studies at Carleton University, the one I just mentioned. Her research brings together design and the social sciences to explore issues of power, equity, and collective identity in the built environment. And Susie's current book, by the way, and I'm really looking forward to this, I'll probably be in the first 10 people to buy it, Suzanne's current book project entitled Constructing the Capital draws from her dissertation uncovering the politics of urban development and image making in Eurasian capital cities. It examines city building campaigns in part democratic, part authoritarian hybrid regimes, foregrounding the cases of Tbilisi, Georgia, that's what we're looking at today, of course, and Skopje, North Macedonia, which we're going to be talking about in February when, when uh, Susie comes back to visit us or technically comes back to visit us. The work demonstrates how architecture and urban design are manipulated for power retention in such regimes, while also highlighting bottom-up community-based strategies to resist these actions. And that's something that will come out today when you see what's going on with this uh, former institute that we're gonna talk about today in Tbilisi. Uh, just some basic details. Dr. Harris Brantz received her PhD in urban studies from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She is a licensed architect in Ontario and co-founder of Collective Domain, a design research practice for spatial analysis, urban activism, architecture, and media in the public interest. As I said, Susie and I were talking just before this event took off. Normal circumstances, we'd have a talk, then we'd go for dinner, we'd talk about things. But Susie, my pledge is, that, like everybody, is that uh, we're going to do it when we get to the other side of this uh, madness, and I look forward to hosting you in Toronto. At this point, I say to you that the floor is entirely yours, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Robert. Okay, let me share my screen here. Everyone can see that. Looking so good. thank you. Oh, can you see? Yeah, perfect. Wonderful. So thank you so much for coming to everybody. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to briefly thank those who made the event possible. So thanks to U of T Saris for hosting the event and especially to Robert Austin and Joseph Hawker. 
And it's great for me as an urban scholar and architect to be able to engage with audiences of global affairs and public policy. It's not something I get to do very often. So I hope we can have an interesting discussion on these topics today. I'd also like to quickly acknowledge the Shota Rustavelli National Science Foundation of Georgia, which helped fund portions of this research. I'm really excited to be a part of your spring event series and to share some of my ongoing work in Tbilisi and then later uh, Skopje, as Robert mentioned. Uh, I should note that this portion of the work, the Tbilisi part, uh, has been done in collaboration with a colleague of mine, David Sichanava of Tbilisi State University. Uh, so today I'm going to share with you the unique story surrounding a building in Tbilisi that's captured my imagination for several years now. And it's, of course, uh, this one that you see here. Originally, the iconic 1930s Marx, Engels, and Lenin Institute, or ML building, as it's known more colloquially, in 2016, it was converted into the seven-star Biltmore Hotel. And as you can see, the original facade and shell of the ML building were retained, but they were heavily renovated. And then this 32-story glass skyscraper was added to the back of the building. And then both parts came together to make the new Biltmore Hotel. Uh, just to kind of show the logistics of that in a few more views, here you can see the project's layout. So this is the ML building in the front and this, uh, the skyscraper for the hotel in the back. Uh, so the original ML building's uh, main spaces were turned into the hotel lobby and conference center. And then the guest rooms and restaurants went inside this new skyscraper in the back quickly showing the, the plan here. So this is the ML building on Rustavelli Avenue, if you've ever been to Tbilisi, and then the new building for the skyscraper in the back. And initially our interest in this building began through our broader concerns about the rapid urban development that's underway all across Georgia. So as you can see here, the past few decades have brought incredibly rushed construction to Tbilisi, especially throughout its historical old city core. And for a number of years now, we've been working on researching these changes as part of a National Science Foundation grant looking at the social impacts of large-scale urban development. We've been studying that in both Tbilisi and Georgia's second largest city of Batumi. So our interest in the ML building and its conversion into the Biltmore Hotel kind of evolved alongside of that research as just one example of Tbilisi's rapid urban change. And just to give you a bit of sense of the Biltmore Hotel's dramatic presence on the skyline, uh, here you can see just how much it towers over the city. So it's sandwiched between Rustavelli Avenue to the south and then uh, the river to the north. And it really has this kind of dominance. You can see how much taller it is than anything in the context. And we were particularly captivated by the iconic nature of the project and wanted to research its somewhat surprising history. Uh, on the surface, this 1938 ML building and the 2016 Biltmore Hotel projects couldn't be more different or distinctly motivated from one another, despite actually being kind of on the exact same project site. And in many ways, they really are polar opposites. So they reflect all that changed from that period of Soviet rule to that of independence through the 1990s. Uh, ML is this kind of explicitly propagandistic use of architecture its design and programming uh, work hard to propound the virtues of communism. And as I'm going to show in a bit more detail in a minute, it's a strong example of what would be called socialist classicist design. It performed as a communist research institute and a library, and it was really kind of quintessential example of this type of architecture under Stalin. And then by contrast, the Biltmore Hotel is a beacon of capitalist opulence. It's all about leisure and high-end tourist consumption. You know, after all, it is a seven-star hotel. And it makes its statement in a more rapidly globalizing city that's increasingly relying on iconic architecture to brand the cityscape and also to kind of bolster the economy. Uh, but in reality, uh, as I'm gonna try and show and argue, these two projects have a lot more in common than may initially seem uh, visible on the surface. So I'll talk you through uh, some of the fascinating similarities and differences that have emerged in this adaptive reuse. And I'm gonna foreground, uh, especially the two's design narratives and how it's connected to ideas of design politics. And this was used to support foreign influence and soft power, which we're gonna get into. 
Uh, this primary design narrative that I'm going to focus on for the building is the idea of friendship among nations, a friendship between those foreign actors that are initiating the construction of these buildings and then their local counterparts that are benefiting from its presence in the city. And we see this friendship of nations narrative first in the Soviet constructed building, which is of course a project of Stalin and Beria, and then again, but in new forms in the Biltmore Hotel, which is a project of these top UAE, uh, United Arab Emirates officials coming into Georgia. And in both situations, Tbilisi's built environment is shaped in a manner beneficial to these foreign interests. Uh, to the broader public, uh, this imposing foreign presence is instead framed as a kind of welcome friendship. And just to step back a bit to theoretically unpack this idea a bit more, uh, several historians and scholars of the history of concepts have examined this idea of friendship among nations. Uh, Yevgeny Roshchin's work, for example, tracks its use as one of the most popular concepts in diplomacy, international law, and politics. Uh, regarding the Soviet Union, uh, Lowell Tillett's The Great Friendship and Terry Martin's The Affirmative Action Empire are two of the most extensive resources. Uh, the Soviet idea of a friendship among nations, or in Russian, Druzhba Narodov, uh, surfaces perhaps most commonly in relation to the nationalities policies, and its impact can be traced all across the Soviet Union. It's not just in Georgia. Uh, as Lowell Tillett's work shows, the concept itself was quite a flexible one. It changed over the decades of Soviet rule and shifted as the party itself kind of went through different ideological positions and uh, different rulerships. Uh, in the Soviet Union, this rhetoric of friendship was primarily introduced first by Stalin in the mid-1930s, and it manifests in everything from official state speeches to the invented traditions of new civic holidays, sports, and of course, arts and architecture. Uh, but it's far less often discussed in terms of the specific ways that it started to make its way into architecture in the built environment. And that's what we really wanted to explore with this research. And it's worth just noting that this uh, Soviet narrative of friendship among nations is of course highly idealized and propagandistic. Uh, there's no mention of a kind of hostility amongst any of the people who constituted the population of the USSR. And this interpretation in many ways runs counter to the accounts of many historians and probably instead should be described as a sort of elaborate historical myth. Uh, at its core, it's also an idea of, um, you know, supporting the Marxist narrative of, a, of how the history of all hitherto society is the history of class struggles, but bringing different groups together through class struggle. And so, for example, in the Stalin quote, you can see that he argues the only way to abolish national inequality, the only way to establish a regime of fraternal cooperation is the liquidation of capitalism and the establishing of a Soviet structure. So in other words, it's a view that the popular masses of all Soviet republics are inherently friendly with each other because of their class interests, which would eclipse any sense of national rivalries. Uh, relative to Soviet expansionism and impressions given that all these neighboring people saw the growing Russian and Soviet state only as an ally and a protector. There's no hint that people might have instead feared Soviet military power or have been suspicious of the state's motives. Uh, and here you see just a couple Soviet propaganda posters supporting this notion of inter-republic friendship. So what about this narrative of friendship among nations in architecture? Uh, throughout the decades of Soviet rule, it often made its way into the built environment. It was supported uh, quite often through things like the creation of friendship monuments, uh, which you can see one up here. This is Vedenka's Fountain of the Friendships of Peoples in Moscow, Russia from 1954. And this is the Russia-Georgia Friendship Monument in Kazbegi, Georgia from 1983. Uh, this is the People's Friendship Arch in Kiev, Ukraine from 1982. And this is the Monument of Bulgarian Soviet Friendship in Varna, Bulgaria from 1978. 
Uh, but there are many other examples that you could pull up that also tap into this narrative of friendship among nations. Uh, there's also many building details or sculptures that also tap into this ideology. And uh, the Emil building in Tbilisi very much fits into these narratives. So I'm going to start back in time with the friendship narrative of that building before getting into the more contemporary narratives of friendship that show up in the newer seven star Biltmore Hotel. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, the story of Tbilisi's Emil building begins not in Georgia, but in Russia. Uh, as you can see depicted here in this early painting, the first Institute of Marx, Engels, and Lenin was established in Moscow in the 1920s. Initially, this Moscow branch served as a local library and an archive. In the 1930s, the Russian Communist Party then expanded the Institute's mandate to include the study and dissemination of communism among the broad masses, both within and outside of the party. By the 1940s, the Institute in Moscow had reached an incredibly impressive collection. It had more than 400,000 books and journals, as well as over 55,000 documents belonging to Marx and Engels. And then over the years, the Institute uh, further expanded its mandate and started to function as a research center and a publishing house. Uh, it supported the highest body of the Communist Party, making it a really crucial part of state propaganda efforts. Then with this uh, Moscow branch as a kind of starting point, uh, beginning in the late 1930s, it was decided that various other Soviet republics should also have these institutes of Marx, Engels, and Lenin. And then in some instances, like in Ukraine and Georgia, the new institutes actually involved amalgamating or replacing existing sort of similar Lenin institutes that were locally present. And that was done in order to have more central control over the content. And by the 1950s, these institutes had been established all across the Soviet Union in places like Georgia, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Ukraine, and even Dagestan. Uh, it was between 1934 and 1938 that the Tbilisi Emil building was constructed. And its aim was to be a sort of broader Trans-Caucasian branch of the Institute. And it, as such, it had a couple mandates. So first it prepared the works of Lenin, Stalin, Marx and Engels for local publication, often translating them into Georgian. Um, it also studied the history of the revolutionary movement in Trans-Caucasia with a specific focus on the role of Stalin. So trying to come to terms with the local history of Soviet communism. And then broadly speaking, it was linked to the state's local propaganda activities. Uh, for the architecture, the building itself uh, was designed by the famous Russian architect, Alexei Shusev, who some of you may have come across uh, because he designed Lenin's mausoleum in Moscow. And as you can see, the Tbilisi Emil building is a kind of giant neoclassical design that also works to convey the power of the Soviet authorities. And, and this really comes through in things like these enormous columns that span the whole height of the building uh, with, with the sense that they're kind of towering over people and it makes anybody on the street feel like they're very small in comparison. Um, Beyond the institution's more ideological mandates and its content inside as a library and as a kind of a hub for a communist doc doctrine, its architecture also worked to convey these ideals of communism through the very building detailing. So as you can see here, the design was highly symbolic in its facade details. Uh, it enabled it to function almost as a kind of public service announcement, the way uh, cathedrals used to back in the day. So people from the outside could uh, pictorially read these images uh, while all of the great works of communism would be held within. And so the main areas of symbolism in the design were these sculptural reliefs on the front facade and they were by famous Georgian artists. And in, in another way, uh, beyond the kind of explicit referencing of these pan-Soviet solidarity messages in the sculptural narratives, which I'm gonna get into in a second, we also see this idea of pan-Soviet cooperation by the fact that they paired Russia's most, one of Russia's most famous, let's say, architects with two of Georgia's most renowned sculptors. And here you can see that 
three meter high frieze as it still exists today. Uh, it features five different panels and they're by the Georgian sculptor Tamar Abakelia. And they depict more nationally focused moments of communist history and Georgian interpretations of popular communist themes. Uh, throughout the panels, the concept of a kind of common goal uniting people under Soviet control was really crucial. And the design engendered cross-republic friendship and perhaps equally importantly, it kind of supported a sense of subservience to the central leadership that Georgia was really a willing partner, uh, a part of the Soviet Union. And that was important because, you know, during the 1920s, uh, many states and territories like Georgia had been at times violently conquered by the Bolsheviks. Uh, so projects like IMO that established new educational institutions and contributed to larger state building campaigns were clearly ways to sort of ameliorate some of those things. And so if I now uh, zoom in a bit onto the details of that freeze, uh, we can see these propagandistic friendship narratives. So this panel is called uh, October in Georgia and it depicts reactions of local Georgians to the events of the Russian Revolution from October 1917 uh, in Petrograd or present day St. Petersburg. And the inclusion of this panel and another one that shows a local protest movement in Batumi, Georgia, worked to support this argument that Georgia had really been a willing partner in the forging of Soviet communism, an ally and a friend to Russia, rather than merely a victim of Bolshevik military expansionism. Uh, the next three freeze panels show common communist themes about worker prosperity. So this one is uh, Georgian industry, Georgian agriculture, and a happy life in communist Georgia. And they communicated the benefits of communism within Georgia by showing how Soviet subjects could work together towards friendship and a future that was prosperous. Uh, as I showed earlier, the building's two primary other sculpture reliefs are these two four by five entablatures on either side. The one on the left commemorates the unity of the working people, which is represented by a Georgian peasant alongside an oil worker from Baku, Azerbaijan, and a Russian worker. And they're carrying the banner written in Georgian, workers of the world unite. And the one on the right symbolizes the worker heroes of the first five-year plan. Uh, as you might notice, uh, both feature Stalin as a central figure. And because of that, they were removed from the ML building in 1990. And here you can see today that those entablatures are missing. Uh, while the main freeze does remain today, uh, these cartouches, this is a technical architecture term, with the busts or the heads of each of the, the main characters of the, you know, the namesake of the building, Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin, were also removed in 1998. They were carved off the front of the building, so they're no longer there. And then soon after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the ML building was repurposed. It, it was used to temporarily host uh, several other important state institutions in that period of uh, recent independence when Georgia had just emerged as its own sovereign state. Uh, so for example, uh, Imel housed the Parliament of Georgia between 1992 and 1995, and it was the place where MPs voted for the first post-independence constitution of the country. Uh, next, Imel hosted the country's constitutional court until 2006, when that was relocated to Batumi. Uh, so the building holds a lot of history and a lot of different um, uh, memories for, for that whole period of transition as well as the Soviet era. Uh, in 2007, the Ministry of Culture abruptly removed the ML building from the heritage list where it had been designated since 1986. And then quickly, one week later, it was uh, sold to a local real estate developer through a series of corrupt dealings. And then shortly thereafter, it was again resold to the UAE's Dabi Group, which was who built the Biltmore Hotel. And the removal of the building from the National Heritage List and its transfer to these private actors triggered several local protest rallies, uh, like the one you're seeing here, organized by local heritage preservation groups. 
uh, people really felt betrayed that this iconic building had been sold off without public consultation. Uh, still, the, the redevelopment uh, leading towards the Biltmore Hotel took place. Uh, here you can see construction beginning on its tower in the back in 2014. So now I'm going to transition over to 2016 to discuss how some of those same narratives of friendship among nations surfaced in the Biltmore Hotel, albeit in new forms. Uh, this image really captures how the Biltmore Hotel made a dramatic arrival in Tbilisi. So if the original ML building communicated its power through all of those facade sculptural decorations and its giant neoclassical columns, uh, then the Biltmore Hotel was using its towering skyscraper to do sort of the same. And no sooner was the building constructed in 2016 then workers started adhering these large white vinyl sheets all along the glass. Uh, they were placed up the entire 150 meter high Western facade of the building. And for any street level observers, this really bizarre application of white sheeting was itself a kind of moment of spectacle and a drama around the building. Everybody wanted to wonder, uh, started to wonder what they were doing. Uh, here you can see window cleaners finalizing that application of the white vinyl on the sheets. So it was soon revealed that all of this was being done as a part of the building's grand opening. This whole Western facade was going to be used as an enormous video projection screen. And the grand opening was indeed a, a really dramatic spectacle for the city. Uh, it was held on the 31st of July, 2016 and it had these opulent displays of fireworks, light shows, artist performances, and various speeches. Uh, according to local news outlets, approximately 5,000 people attended, and that included a number of very prominent figures like the Georgian Prime Minister, as well as foreign officials, including UAE's Sheikh Nahin bin Mubarak al Nahyan and other members of the Emirati royal family. Uh, using that Western facade covered in white, the main feature of the event was that video being projected onto the building. And as you might imagine, the narrative of that video was the growing presence of a strong friendship between Georgia and the United Arab Emirates. And this new friendship could be witnessed throughout Georgia in the late 2000s and early 2010s with the increased rate of Emirati investment in the country. Uh, so I'll show you in a minute how this friendship was uh, shown through that opening ceremony, through uh, juxtaposed imagery of both countries. But here you see it uh, in the case of them juxtaposing the flags of both Georgia and the UAE. So really showing the coupling of the two states. Uh, it's likely that the UAE decided to play up this narrative of friendship among nations in the Biltmore Hotel's grand opening for some of the same reasons of, as the Soviets. As a large foreign investment in arrive, sorry, as a large foreign interest arriving in the small South Caucasian Republic, uh, the UAE has been viewed by local Georgians with a lot of skepticism as a somewhat uninvited outsider. Um, you know, broadly speaking, in light of all of this rapid development across Tbilisi over the past decade, there's been a good amount of ambivalence regarding outside influences through uh, foreign investment, particularly that that comes uh, from Muslim Gulf countries, uh, because Georgia is 95% Christian. And as a part of our research on this project, we conducted six focus groups with local residents. And our findings reinforced that understanding of skeptical local attitudes. They showed that people perceive large scale investments to be aimed not really at locals, but instead at foreign elites. And in particular, many of the focus group respondents expressed great skepticism regarding investment that was coming from the UAE, Iran, and Turkey. And part of that skepticism was because, of course, since the mid 2000s, foreign investment in Georgia by Gulf states really has expanded exponentially. Uh, in both 2007 and 2008, which is right around the time the Biltmore Hotel was being planned, uh, the UAE's 
was Georgia's top foreign investor, representing a whopping 20% of the country's FDI, or a total of 300 million USD. And these investments were mostly geared towards real estate in the tourism and hospitality sectors, uh, like the Biltmore Hotel. In 2007, speaking of another proposal for a possible 3 billion dirham or 800 million US dollar business partnership with the Emirates, uh, Georgian President Mikhail Saakashvili called the relationship a strong partnership in a short period of time. So really echoing this sense of uh, friendship among nations. The opening ceremony video for the Biltmore Hotel attempted to frame Georgia and the UAE's rapidly forming friendship in an equally rapid period of eight minutes. Uh, so now we'll walk you through some screenshots of the video relative to this theme of friendship. But uh, if you want on your own time, you can feel free to also look up the video on YouTube and watch all eight minutes of it. It's uh, pretty interesting. Uh, so as a part of efforts to demonstrate the UAE's benevolence as a rapidly rising foreign investor, the Biltmore Hotel was literally presented as a gift to Georgia at the opening ceremony. Uh, so here you can see a series of screenshots of how it's first uh, wrapped as a giant present, and then the bow is untied and the building unwraps as a gift. And here are just a couple other screenshots highlighting uh, how the narrative showed historical events in Georgia's past. Uh, as with those Soviet freezes in the original ML building, the historical content is very carefully framed to show a sense of collaboration and friendship. And it showcases only select Georgian historical successes and sort of leaves out other parts that are a little bit suspicious. And in this way, a stronger case is made for why Georgia could benefit from the outside attention of UAE investors. Uh, as one example of that, the animation focuses a lot on the famous Georgian poem, The Knight in the Panther's Skin. And the protagonist of that poem is an Arab prince. Uh, so you get this sense of a, a kind of nationally charged Georgian poem, but the one that's ever so loosely connected to Arab culture. And so through this reframing of history, an argument is made for a kind of centuries old bond or friendship between the area of the South Caucasus and that of the Gulf. Uh, in relation to images of the city in the video, it also uh, misre misrepresents a lot of the current state of the built environment of Tbilisi. Uh, for example, as you see here, only very select and really cartoonish drawings are used to show what Tbilisi's skyline looks like. Uh, the focus is on these sort of low rise, rather deteriorating vernacular, somewhat old fashioned 19th century buildings. And that's despite there being many new iconic works of architecture in Georgia in the mid, uh, mid 2000s. Uh, so the implicit message here is that while Georgia may be successfully independent as a country, it's still in need of outside assistance for its effective urban development. Uh, so again, kind of like the ML building, uh, what is perhaps initially presented as an equal friendship among nations soon morphs into an unequal power relationship between local and foreign actors. Uh, how the UAE can provide such assistance is then shown through the showcasing of dramatic city building projects back at home within the Emirates. Uh, beginning with the scene of a gulf against a kind of rather vacant landscape with just a few oil rigs. Uh, a Dow boat then appears with the three UAE flags and the scene rapidly transforms into one that shows Dubai's uh, mass high rise development. And then in contrast to those rather flat and cartoon like renderings of Shanti Old Tbilisi, the audience now watches as a kind of high tech computer renderings show new architectural projects within the UAE. Uh, for example, they're shown a series of iconic UAE projects that communicate to the Georgian audience that with Emirati support, they too can benefit from the offshoots of a sort of brand Dubai. And the audience learns quickly that in Georgia, it's not going to be a friendship among nations uh, of equal collaboration and exchange but instead perhaps one of foreign dependency and support of a Georgian reliance on the UAE to reach its development goals. 
Uh, and as I said, if you're curious, uh, you can watch the whole video on YouTube. Uh, this message of the UAE coming to the rescue as a kind of force of modernization lived on well past that grand opening event with the dramatic video. Uh, today, the building continues to broadcast a sense of Georgian Emirati friendship by projecting uh, enormous sized flags of each of the country on a 15 meter or five story TV that's uh, permanently affixed to the top of the building, as you can see here. And it's somewhat surprising that as an independent nation, uh, Georgia would allow its tallest building in the capital to constantly be displaying the flag of another nation. It's a bit of a reminder that the pride of the Biltmore Hotel isn't really Georgian, but it's largely Emirati. Uh, still, if we're comparing the original ML building with the Biltmore Hotel, it's worth noting that the arrival of Gulf investment in Georgia in the 2000s follows a rather different course than that of, say, 1920s Soviet control. Rather than imposed political and militaristic influence, uh, the presence of the UAE has so far only been much softer and purely economic. It's also been invited by the Georgian government. Uh, so to just briefly summarize, and then hopefully we can switch to a bit more of a fruitful open discussion. Uh, over the past century, this building has undergone a shift in symbolic narratives, while still somehow miraculously maintaining this notion of friendship among nations. And I've shown how both the Soviet and contemporary UA governments have used this idea of friendship narratives and architecture to further their individual goals. Uh, for the Soviets, this narrative was used to work toward the development of communism. For the UAE, it was to establish the country as a new 21st century global superpower that's exporting uh, Grand Dubai. Uh, the Soviets relied on urban development to foster comradeship, not for investment purposes, but say more for biopolitical governance. They were using architecture to help create the ideal Soviet person. Uh, the UAE, by contrast, isn't responsible for governance in Georgia, of course, and uh, has not yet used its influence towards hegemonic or militaristic means. Its use of this narrative of friendship among nations really has been to foster acceptance for its local economic investments. Uh, but overall, in both campaigns, we see that for well over a century, Tbilisi has remained subject to the development whims of powerful outside actors. Uh, so more broadly speaking, I think this raises some really interesting questions about the direction of Tbilisi's urban development moving forward. Uh, what we see happening today is that the UAE is just one foreign actor keen on making a mark on the city's skyline. Uh, there's, of course, many others, including Turkey and China. And this is quite different from the 19th and 20th century, uh, when the city was largely influenced by the one directional presence of Imperial and Soviet Russia. And as a result, the way Tbilisi's skyline is taking form today is much more fragmented and with greater diversity in foreign interests. Uh, despite Georgian independence, the country is still quite limited in terms of dictating its own urban trajectory. Iconic construction in the capital continues to, at least in part, communicate the interests of foreign powers. Uh, so I'll stop there and then hopefully we can open it up a bit more uh, for a discussion. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, that, I've seen it twice, Susie, but I loved it. And oh, I've got friends who are architects are in the audience and I've got some other friends. Uh, my wife was watching it on another computer screen because I think it's such an engaging presentation. And if you haven't been to Tbilisi, it's an amazing tour of Tbilisi. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Um, I've got uh, the Q&A tool, by the way, which you can use to ask a question. Uh, so, and there's a note on the, on the screen there that says, you know, for audience members, attendees are welcome to submit questions at any time during the event using the Q&A tool found at the bottom of the Zoom window. We will answer as many questions as time allows during the Q&A session directly following the lecture. So I'm all set now to start taking some questions if anyone wants to throw a question in. And while people get organized, I want to ask the question first, because that's my right as the chair and moderator. You mentioned that stuff was, you know, first of all, let me put it out there. I don't like that building. 
okay? And I, I'm not sure I wanna live in a country where a prime minister goes to open a hotel because it's, it's just not that big a deal. But that's a different kind of even cynical comment, Susie, and I apologize, but what you mentioned China and Turkey as another imprint on Tbilisi. What are, what, what are they up to? Yeah, um, lots of different things uh, at different scales, which is pretty interesting. So uh, the main Chinese project in Tbilisi is a, a Hualing project. And it, it, I have actually with another colleague a paper on that too. So it was part of the Youth Olympic Festival that was being hosted there, the Summer Youth Olympic Festival, which is uh, a second tier mega event used to train athletes who then hopefully go on to the, the top tier Olympic competition. And so they wanted to host this in uh, 2010. So they first uh, asked the city um, to think of a way that they could make the athletes village and some of the support facilities for it. But then uh, Hualing was interested also in developing a special economic job. Sorry, the story is so complicated. I always never decide where to start it. Right. Um, so they took a large piece of land uh, near Tbilisi Sea and used that temporarily to host the athletes village for the event. But then it would go back into the hands of Hualing who could then use it as a special economic zone. So it was it was quite a large development and lots of controversy around that too, and resulted in the creation of a new category of special economic zone. Uh, so we wrote this paper, It's uh, I can put it in the chat in a minute, uh, with David Gogashvili looking at uh, how there was a coinciding of exceptions, the ex exceptional legislative planning of cities for a sports event, and then the exceptional one for special economic zone. So starting to look at the scale of some of these projects, uh, some of them are really large in their magnitude. They're no longer just infill sites, but um, enormous developments in say entire districts of the city, uh, which raises some interesting concern for urban studies in that regard. Um, and then some of them are just smaller, say, residential apartment buildings for, say, the Turkic developers. And I would say Turkey is perhaps more uh, active in Batumi. Uh, but, and, and then there may be like Azeri Turkish partnerships that are done. Uh, there's a lot of different aspects of uh, foreign money coming in for speculative design and uh, development for tourism buildings all across mm -hmm. Batumi as well. Yeah, I'll put that paper in the, the chat if anyone. Yeah, put it in the. We can send. We keep a list, and then if if it doesn't work, we can send it later on. I've got some uh, some terrific questions in the in the in the chat box, and I'm not you know Susie and the Zoom landers. I call it Zoomville. I'm not supposed to name people, but I like to hint that I, I know the people because we invited you know a certain group of people to this event so we could have this type of conversation. So I kind of acknowledged them in a weird way. So I've got a question from a guy who's been to Georgia a lot, and he works in the Center for Criminology and Social Legal Studies, and he's a good friend. So I'm going to read you his question. But before okay. I do that, another very high-ranking official from the Center for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies high ranking, even higher than me, says thunderous applause. Okay, so these are two things I'm giving you, but back to sociolegal studies. Thank you for this fascinating presentation. I have visited Tbilisi a number of times and have colleagues there, so I've had a chance to observe some of the controversies over historic preservation there. As you were speaking, I was interested by the apparent lack of outrage over the privatization of this formerly public space and its subsequent defacement or repurposing, if you prefer. Do you see a difference in attitudes among Georgians towards pre-Soviet building and those from the Soviet period that might explain how this privatization was able to occur? And then he added a quick, as an analogy, I would point out the deterioration over many years of the Soviet World War II monument in Vake Park. Okay, so there's a lot there, Susie, I'll let, and I'll come back and I'll look at this stuff, okay? Yeah, excellent question, uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you for all of the generous comments. Uh, 
I, I agree. I think there's something interesting there. I would I would say that there was a good amount of outrage for this project. So one of the interesting things was um, to be able to add the tower in the back. They also had to demolish a residential building that was there, and there was there was quite a bit of outrage about that, uh, particularly thinking about the eminent domain to claim that site and then demolish it, which I didn't have time to get into in the talk. Uh, there's kind of you go on too many tangents if you're not careful. Right. But um, there definitely has been a lot of upset about this. And the email, it was kind of interesting. I assumed uh, in line with the question that Soviet architecture would get less attention, but I think ML was fairly cherished, maybe because of its uh, use in the, in the early independence period for all of these other interim uses. Um, but, uh, some of the public didn't, I mean, I, you're right, there wasn't like large, large protests in the street against this. I think it also was at a bit of a, a pivotal moment when there was urban activism was just starting to grow and take off in the city. Uh, there's definitely a lot more protest and outrage, say, around demolition in the old city than there might be around some Soviet sites. But I think that's changing. I think any Soviet architecture that's in this early neoclassicist, Stalinist, Stalinist uh, phase is more favored than, say, a 1970s Soviet building would be. That's where you really see the apathy, I think, in most of the public, this like um, sense that things are too gray or modernist, the conflation of anything that is a modernist architecture with a sense of it being Soviet. Uh, but in the early in the early buildings from the 1930s, you do see some appreciation for it, uh, at least growing now. Uh, I would say, point to another example being um, the former Stalinist resort town of Skaltubo, where mm. my two research colleagues and I are also doing some work where the whole town is a uh, Stalinist classicist architecture, except for some of the later uh, sanatoria buildings. And there, there is a sense that they should be preserved or, or repaired. It's really when you get into, say, the Khrushchevka or some of the later buildings, the residential buildings, where people have a real aversion to Soviet architecture. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's some other facet to that question, but a, a great question, and I think it is worth discussing. Uh, you know, I think anything earlier is seen as more cherished because it toes the line of some of those national narratives too. Of, it can be old or new, but it just shouldn't be Soviet. Uh, Susie, what I'll do after, I'll put you in touch with the, the questioner because you, you have a lot to talk about and, and, and he's very- That'd be great. He's very much a Georgia, among other things, a Georgia specialist. Here's, this is a question from one of my students in the MA program who lives in the same town I spent a lot of my childhood in. There's my little anecdote. Is, is how do you make sense of the building of skyscrapers whether in Tbilisi or other capital cities, as proclaiming their place within a kind of capitalist modernity. Yes, skyscrapers are interesting, especially in a city like this. So there's always like, I think here the main goal is the iconicity and the height, right? It's breaking the the zoning barrier for any other buildings nearby. The Radisson Hotel is where I also didn't have time to mention this is where they projected the video from. So it's a, a the Soviet era building was the kind of in tourist uh, main location for tourists coming in in the 60s, 70s. But that's where they shot the video out of to be able to reach that whole Western facade. Um, but prior to that, the, there was really no tall buildings in Tbilisi. So yes, there's a sense of iconicity and height somehow representing um, modernization or globalization um, for whichever reasons. But, but often then it's a, a kind of risk of how do you fill these buildings, they're really large buildings. And but to me, as a kind of side note, is a fascinating study in that too, where some of the buildings built by Saakashvili that are taller are actually kind of more like a, a skeletal because how are you gonna fill them? So alphabetic tower is really just a kind of cage with a, a dome on the top, which is now a restaurant. And the technical unit, former technical university building, now Le Meridian, has a large kind of extended point on the top, which is kind of what skyscrapers in many cities did uh, for many years, is to get the tallest one, the TV antenna would be even taller or longer. 
Um, but the, the competition for skyscrapers to make a mark is, is not necessarily only a capitalist thing. If you think back to the proposal for the Palace of the Soviets, which was supposed to be uh, in Moscow as one of the tallest buildings, uh, never realized, of course, but one that would contend with anything coming out of New York. Uh, I think there's some interesting comparisons there as well that skyscrapers are have all long been these kind of iconic markers of uh, success, not necessarily just a capitalist success. Thanks. And the, the, the young man who asked the question added, thank you very much for your insightful presentation. This is just a quick comment from an architect in Toronto, oh, a really, really super close friend of mine. So she just commented, when I first saw the tower of the hotel, I felt that it looked like a monument, a Soviet powerful obelisk-like structure. It seemed to be solid rather than glass. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, I say every now and then you can, I like, I like kind of straddling design in the social sciences because you can take one hat off and put on the other. And usually I don't get too much into aesthetic discussions because I think, uh, you know, they're very subjective. Some, somebody loves something and somebody else uh, hates it. But, but I agree, there's something about this building that I always, as an architect, was like not convinced by. And even this, the way that it steps back so much Usually you would only step back like that to respect a kind of um, a light casting. Uh, so you were not casting shadows on buildings because the most lucrative real estate is gonna be the higher up. It's got the best views and it's um, kind of more desirable space. So there's a lot in the design of this building that is really a shame. And I, I've said it in other contexts, if you were gonna do such a grotesque violation of the city, uh, it could have at least been with something that will stick around for a while and be built and kind of be more iconic. Uh, the inside of the building too is uh, really for a particular type of taste. I think it's quite opulent. It, it's a fascinating thing, you know, to walk through the lobby uh, of what was a kind of quintessential beacon of communism now turned into a seven star hotel. Uh, it's really strong. There's marble everywhere, and there, there's kind of opulent um, lamps, and and uh, yeah, I, I think I agree. And a lot of people have voiced a kind of shame that they wish the architecture could have at least been something else if it was going to do such damage. Yeah, I, I'm going to emphasize the grotesque violation aspect of. <laughs> <laughs> of your comment, okay? Because it, but maybe it's as you said, maybe it's not there for the long time. You know, the long term. You know, <laughs> we can't rule out that someone says, you know, we're knocking that down. <laughs> okay, but let's leave that. I have another question. I have some really good questions here. Uh, this is from a student, also one of my students, a grad who's been to Tbilisi, in fact, with me, and she has some strong connection to Latvia. This is her. Oh, it's like that show, front page challenge. I don't know. You wouldn't remember that. It's a long time ago. Georgia has publicly stated its desire to join the European Union. I am wondering how do you think these various imprints, Turkey, China, Russia, et cetera, affect Georgia's current desires to join the EU? Would Tbilisi's cityscape need to change to better reflect their current EU motives? If it does, what are the challenges you see there? Great question. Also, another, I'm getting all these little chances to plug in things that I've been working on or that people are doing. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. So I did uh, in, earlier in my PhD some research looking at how the symbolism of Europeanness, which is of course its own nebulous term worth investigating, uh, makes its way into um, architecture in Georgia. Uh, I, I think they're both there and they're competing in very interesting ways. Uh, so if you look, at uh, things like the Peace Bridge. The Peace Bridge is often lit up with the Council of Europe flag uh, and even Hero Square, which uh, was created to kind of uh, commemorate different soldiers. It's a kind of roundabout with an iconic um, monument in the middle that has a light that shines out of it. It's often been illuminated with the Council of Europe colors and flags. Um, and then uh, the paper that I focused on looking at the idea of European architecture coming back was more focused on Batumi, where uh, the old city was uh, regenerated in a way that could make it look uh, like a more European city. And it, I think it goes back to this idea of a place being either ultra modern and new, like this kind of uh, blurred vision of what 
Europe might be today, which of course is uh, all problematic. Uh, and then either that or very old, it could be look, hearkening back to the kind of old uh, city centers of many European capitals. So these things exist in tension in interesting ways. And not all projects are, are super iconic, but many of them are. And they're all part of how the cityscape is taking form right now uh, in both of those cities. It's quite interesting. It's a great question. Excellent. And again, uh, the, the person who asked the question is, is really interested in her, her work when we were together in Tbilisi was focused on urban design. And I actually think she's probably taking that project a bit further. So uh, oh, great. with you, I'd like to put her in touch with you, Susie. Ah, yeah, that's great. Right. And she's got a deep interest in Georgia. Just a quick, you know, because reading these questions gets very excited and I always get very excited anyway. But I wanted to mention that the architect who asked about the obelisk also commented that I loved your lecture. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Anyway, a, I'm trying to, I don't, such I a great audience. Just, what a rare treat it, to have such a great audience. It's not just a great audience. It's a super informed audience too. Which is, yeah. I know a lot of these people and they're really, you know, I'm really proud. I'm so happy to see my students there and stuff. And I can't wait to talk about Scopia because I, you know, I have a lot to say there. But I'm going to give you one more. I'm just looking here because I've lost track. Um, this is from the gentleman who said thunderous applause, who also works at the center with me. And he's also a very, very close friend. Thank you for the talk. Uh, question. You mentioned the fragmented development of the city today. Where are the urban planners? Is there any meaningful effort in that regard? Are they just too underfunded and powerless vis-a-vis -vis the enormous capital coming in from foreign sources? Um. Yes, great question. Uh, they are, and I would even say it's not just foreign. There's a lot of development um, from within. So the one of the biggest projects. So we, we talked about, you know, um, is there there's foreign interests and uh, their initiatives, and then the European as a kind of uh, another avenue of changing the symbolism of the sky. But also, uh, I think the Georgian aspect of it could be considered. So Bitzina Ivanishvili, who is uh, George's main oligarch and the kind of nebulous figure that continually floats in and out of politics is driving one of the largest projects in the city right now called Panorama Tbilisi, uh, which goes from the main um, Liberty Square, uh, again, kind of demolishing the site and building one huge large hotel and conference center that by cable cars will go up to the hillside. Yeah and uh, be another resort facilities. And it, it involved many, many changes in legislation and the creation of a new category of project linked to almost infrastructure for its approval, uh, which is tied to some of the politics at the time that uh, the city level, level government was under the United National Movement, whereas the national level was under Georgia Dream. So you had two political parties rivaling through this project uh, and planners are kind of awash in a lot of this, unfortunately. You have, um, I think that there just must be behind the scenes messages that this project's gonna go ahead and any legislative initiative to try and stop it uh, faces a lot of opposition. There was a huge amount of opposition in that uh, project. And then the, the greater challenge on top of that is you get into uh, what I'm fascinated with is some of the like hybrid regime politics around it all in the sense of uh, the local government stopping a project that may be pushed by the national government and people saying this is politically motivated that you're stopping it. So whether or not you're stopping it because it is legitimately poor urban design or you're stopping it as a political means uh, starts to become part of the conversation that people are having. Uh, but planners are trying a lot. There's a lot, I, I should say this, I always try to underscore this, the local organizations and, and advocates are doing an incredible amount of work and are some of the few reasons why anything is saved and preserved. Uh, but it's very challenging. So even with that panorama project, so we made multiple uh, freedom of information requests to try and find out exactly what was going on with that project. and they're just uh, met by kind of smoke and mirrors of saying this is semi-private, so we can't disclose it, even this part. Uh, so planners uh, at the city level, I think are, are fairly powerless in this, but there has been some promising developments in, in recent years because of protests. And I think that's, that's one of the key takeaways is that when there is public uh, concern and outrage, 
it can make a difference in these instances. Mm -hmm. It just, it's hard for the public in many ways to even know to follow. You need uh, planners and those with architectural design backgrounds to kind of translate some of these things before they happen. Because if it's just when the demolition crews arrive, it's always a little late. Um, yeah, but but great question, and I think it's something that maybe needs a bit more uh, attention in terms of thinking about uh, governance in the country. You often think about uh, democratic measures in other areas, but I think city planning is a huge one that should get additional attention. I've got. I'm going to get you to shift gears a bit because I've got a gentleman who's going to ask for some travel advice. Okay, so and that's fine too. He writes uh, a friend in Tbilisi who is watching, and you know, don't forget Tbilisi's nine hours ahead. So that's a devoted fan. Thank you. Yeah. He's that person's at two in the morning watching, and I'm delighted with that. Now, a friend in Tbilisi said Georgia is the most safe country in the world to travel. Do you agree, considering regional rebellions? And <laughs> Which regional? Okay, but you're that's a that's a great question. I mean, I, I imagine uh, Saris has some of their own great scholars looking at safety, including Matthew Light. Uh, but as a, just a visitor and scholar, I would say yes, it's incredibly safe. The, the reasons behind that, and what we consider safe, are, are, are kind of great conversation starters. Uh, so, at the local level, I, I think I've I've been in very few places that safe. Uh, where there's there's very little petty crime um, around the city. Some of that has to do with Saakashvili, well, I would say a good amount, with Saakashvili cracking down on crime. Uh, whether or not that means there isn't high level corruption, I think is a different conversation. So there's a lot of uh, crime in Georgia that I think has to do with high level corruption that we will never see as say tourists mm -hmm. or citizens walking around. Um, but it's a very safe city, but some some great, scholars looking at that, I would say, look at the work of Gavin Slade yeah. and uh, Matthew Light, who've both done outstanding work researching safety in Georgia. Let's, uh, Gavin will spend some time with us in Toronto. Uh, and he's a terrific person and he's, he's much missed. And, you know, because we were talking kind of in the, you know, almost in code, Susie, the Matthew Light had already asked a question. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty certain you already figured that out. Um, uh, he's a good colleague, so I don't need to. So that's one email I don't. I out him? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. Just a scholar I've heard of. Yeah, Matt Light has done a lot of work on Georgia, and he's doing some big work on Ukraine now too, and Russia as well. So that's terrific. I'm going to shift gears a little bit because we got about I don't know ten minutes left. Susie, this is just me talking now. What are your favorite buildings in Georgia? And if you have your desktop, you should show them to us because. Yeah, I love Tbilisi architecture. I've got all these terrific books, you know, that my students always buy me. I, when we do these trips, they buy me, they always give me a coffee table book. I love coffee table book. And one of them is behind me, but I don't want to go get it. But, you know, Tbilisi is so inspirational in so many ways, leaving aside the Biltmore, like forget it, who cares? But what, re what really, as an architect, you know, inspires you about that city? Yeah, so much. It, it is a beautiful city, you're right, and it has some outstanding architecture from many, many different periods. Uh, I think it doesn't even have to be the most iconic or stunning. I, uh, so many residential buildings to walk yeah. around. Uh, so uh, my apartment, or I should say mine and my husband's apartment is um, on the north side of the river in Marginishvili, yeah. and there's some really beautiful old buildings there. Uh, that just have so much history to them. Uh, I personally have a soft spot for the cable cars, uh, the cable car stations in Georgia, which was another oh, yeah. project that I did with a colleague. Um, in particular, the the very first cable car state lower station is in the uh, Academy of Science building, right beside Rustavelli Metro. It's a kind of spherical building. Uh, let me see if I can find an internet picture of it and put it in the chat. Um, but but it's a wonderful building. Uh, some of the other ones are much more streamlined in their design as it got into later Soviet era. Um, but I think, I mean, uh, people love uh, Orbeladze's wedding palace, which is mm -hmm. in the east, which is a beautiful building. But I sometimes just like uh, everyday buildings or some of the old factories. Uh, it's a beautiful city to wander around, as you say. 
And there, there are some excellent books that pick up on some of the vernacular styles. And you can, you can really tell the history of the city by seeing how its architecture has changed, how buildings were uh, renovated and uh, modified over the years. Um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. It's a good one. Are there any favorites? Are there any it's like favorite children? How do you pick your favorite child? <laughs> I don't know. No comment. <laughs> you have one child. <laughs> See, I'm showing you this book here, Tbilisi. You know, you can, but I love the balconies in these old. Yes. You know, there's this, you know, like you can see here, I don't know, you see, you know, because you just wander around, but this is this, this is one of these books my students gave me, it's really. Oh, yeah. that's a great one. Yeah, it's terrific. I got a couple more, but, um, okay, I'm going to go, is there, I got to look again in the chat box. Hang on, sorry. Um, no, we're good in the chat box. So then I'm going to ask you just one last question. Do you mind? Yeah, sure. Wrap us up because you gave us a super tour. And again, we're hosting you next month on uh, Skopje, North Macedonia. My last question is, I know, you know, the first time I saw you present, you know, you were with your husband, who's, uh, you know, quite a well-known figure in Georgia. He works with an institute that we're very proud to work with, which is the Caucasus Resource and Research Center based in Tbilisi, which does amazing work, everybody. It's crrc.org. And I mean, from for data, that's the place to go when you want to talk about the Caucasus. But so just as a kind of wrap up, take us out of architecture and thinking about things. What can you tell us about the COVID world of Georgia right now, because I'm interested because they they were doing so well at the beginning. And can you? And I know your husband would have some insights there too. But what's going? Bring us just up to date in Georgia because this is very important. Yeah, I think it did. Uh, the The country was doing well originally. You're right, and cases uh, were dropping quite a bit. I mean, it's kind of the the second wave story in many locations that. Uh, it's been very hard uh, to keep up the stamina once people uh, did, you know, the first lockdown was was something that everyone felt they had the capacity to do as this short-term uh, exceptional initiative. And then in the summer, there was a, a sense that things may be improving. And so the cases really were lower there, um, but then invariably a second wave has risen quite a bit. and. Uh, the country's just struggled with different lockdown measures or curfew measures uh, and has not yet gone back to any of the, the major initiatives of like blocking intercity travel or really shutting things down. Um, but the numbers are still high. And so I think it's, it's definitely of concern as it is in many places. And it, it's uh, particularly hard to keep that stamina going. Um, so uh, we've been monitoring it to see what might uh, might develop in the weeks ahead still you know and I think part of it too there was several reports that started to show that of course like any of these things that uh, many of the companies working with the government had made large profits and there was some kind of questionable use of um, partisan companies and all of that starts to tie into people being skeptical about some of the measures uh, so we'll see. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I've i been watching it carefully and it, and it is concerning. We've been, we're supposed to go back to Georgia many times, including now going into the summer, as I'm sure you are too, with uh, your travel plans and everyone's, but just trying to stay digitally connected to everyone there so that we can keep an eye on how things are going. But that's what we're, as I said, we would have gone, we would always leave on the Friday before a reading week, which would be this year, the 12th of February. So this is the first year in a number of years and uh, we're missing our friends there as I'm sure you are. Um, but, uh, you know, fingers crossed. I remain, a, you know, I have to be an optimist, right? So, uh, you know, let's hope, fingers crossed. But uh, Susie, thanks. And I, uh, and I really appreciate that you join us this afternoon. As I said, we had a really good audience, really, you know, people who know what they're doing and a lot of nice students too. So I look forward to seeing you in February and uh, I know it's super cold and it's cold here, but Ottawa's, you know, I grew up, I went to Carleton as I told you. So I had Ottawa winters when it was much colder. It was like minus 30. So I'm sure everyone's going to be okay. And you got that lovely canal to skate on. So, yeah. Hopefully, yes. Thank you so much to everyone for coming. Thank you, Robert and Joseph. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. It's like I said, it's not every day, unless I'm usually in Georgia, that I get to engage in such rich discussions about these topics. So I really appreciate everyone taking the time to come, particularly amidst 
Zoom fatigue and long winter and, and all of it. So thank you for uh, your really engaging conversation and for inviting me. My pleasure. And so we'll see you in February, but in the meantime, I'll put you in touch with a student uh, so you guys can talk urban renewal in Tbilisi. And to my audience and to my dear friends who are out there, I say thanks very much and uh, see you in Zoomville soon. Take care. Thanks. Bye.